We now have Robert, uh, Robin Upton uh, talking about the uh, plutocracy. And uh, let's have a warm welcome for Robin. Thanks. Thank you. I'm speaking on a brief history of plutocracy. Now, that, just, that first word, plutocracy, means rule by the rich. That's something that I'm glad to say has become more in focus, thanks to Occupy. So, this is a very general talk. I've got 20,000 years of world history to put into 20 slides. So, <laughs> I'm focusing specially uh, on Europe, because that's quite important in development of plutocracy. And this is the public story of money that if you study economics, you've heard. I mean, I didn't study economics much, as little as I could, uh, could help. I don't think I could have made this talk if I had been told this is how economics is. So, money, so what it means, if you, if you know economics, that, if you don't know economics, that's not, that's not a hindrance. That might even be a help to understand this. Money is a medium of exchange, store of value, measure of productivity. It's always taught as like, okay, this is economics and that's politics and that's something separate and law. But uh, I'm here to suggest that perhaps there's a private story of money, that it's means of extracting tribute. It's a means whereby a small number of people who run the show get all the other suckers to work for them. It's unsafe store of value. If you've worked, you think, okay, if I worked eight hours a day, I could get more than if I worked four hours a day. Yeah, probably true. What about somebody who earns 50 times as much as you? He's not working 400 hours a day. He's working for the right people. And it's certainly not independent of the legal and political systems. And I'm here to try to get rid of some of the misinformation. So we're going right back to when people were hunter-gatherers. Now these colors are constant through this presentation. So green is food. This is the order that they appear. People are first bothered with food, and then there's violence, black, labor, orders, and money. And these are kind of a, a pair that go together. If somebody's giving you orders, in modern day, they're probably also giving you money to make sure that you follow the orders. So, people originally, effectively, no social classes. Everybody's main focus is, okay, how do we get food? And then they all share the food that they've got. So that is the story for a very long time. There's a limit to how large these kind of family-type tribes get. When they get beyond a certain number, they tend to split, and then you have another tribe that runs around, and we'll get onto that later. But uh, that's the first social differentiation. When you're having more and more of these tribes in a limited area, not always, but sometimes things get a bit violent. People say, look, we were here first. This food belongs to us, clear off. So the hunters, probably the men, they were, became warriors, and okay, they did a bit of food, but they got more and more specialized to defend against the guys next door. And still, for most of the history, people are basically farmers. So how does this change? This changes with agriculture. Agriculture is a big thing, because okay, now people can grow food, and that is very important for possessions. If you're a hunter-gatherer, your property is basically what you can carry around. If you're doing agriculture, then you can live in the same place. So you can have a house. That's nice. So few people, I put, call them artisans. They're making houses. They're maybe making weapons for the warriors, making chicken runs, whatever they're making. So we have a class of laborers. So still, the farmers, they're feeding everybody. The laborers, they're providing goods for everybody. And the warriors, hunters, they are defending against the guys next door. So this is about 10,000 BC, more or less. So the next great innovation occurs, whoops, six months later, <laughs> 9,999, when the harvest comes, the old ethic of the hunter-gatherers, hey, lots of food, great, let's have a party. You clear the place out of food and then you go somewhere else. Well, you can't do that if you're cultivating the land. You get a bumper harvest, lots of food, that's great. Some of the guys are thinking, hey, no, I think we better keep this because it might be a few months until we get some more food here. So you need a new ethic. And okay, that's our first rulers. We've got rules about when you can eat and when you can't eat. So you can eat if you're busy planting and planning ahead. Um, now these are not distant rulers on high. This is the most respected people and probably the elder men. 
saying things like, okay, yeah, let's, let's plan, let's plant this, and then we've got orders. Now, they're giving orders to these guys. If they're the older men, they're not physically going to be stopping everybody from eating, but you have a granary, maybe in the city, because your, your cities become possible because of increased population. Then you have maybe a couple of guards with some spears outside the granary. And this is, is so notice what's happening here. They are now ready to do violence to the farmers or to the artisans because they're following these rules. So this allows the population size to increase. Now, I said about the, the limit to group size. The, this is, okay, I put 150. That is Dunbar's number. He was an anthropologist who studied primates in Africa, looked at chimpanzees and gorillas and their social groupings, and said, okay, well, homo sapiens, they have a bigger brain. They can remember more names and faces. And if you've got, got a few friends, sure, you don't, uh, you don't have trouble to remember them. And remember, if somebody owes you one, you're not going to forget that if you've got half a dozen friends. If you've got 150 friends, it gets harder. If you've got 500 friends, then you're losing the, the Übersicht. You're losing the, the view. Okay, who is the guy who's cheating me? Who's the guy who I have to, to pay back for last time? So what do you do? Because they had large populations together, they came up with a new technology, the local currency. That's called a human, human uh, economy here. Now, this is not actually money as such. Don't think this, they invented money. Money was shells or beads or feathers. This was typically, it was something that you would put on your person to make you more beautiful, more respectable. Um, and it was standardized in a community. But it is a very important step in the foundation of plutocracy. Because now we have a physical object, and somebody's got a lot of them, they are a, a wealthy person. Maybe they're just wearing lots of feathers on their head, but this is something that you can say, okay, I have a lot of this, and he doesn't, so he's a poor person, I'm a rich person. These guys are not in charge, this isn't a plutocracy yet, but that's a vital step. So the next step is, these are the same groups as we had before. I've changed this, I've put a crown on the top of the ruler, because quite often they put a crown, they used to cover themselves with gold as a kind of a hint to how you should treat them. And they said, okay, we're going to invent a better technology because if you have the Roman Empire, you can't run that with beads and feathers and shells. And they, that was all specific to a small community. If you've got an empire, you better have a large scale community. And in Europe, the one that they hit upon was this system of metal discs that maybe you're familiar with. They said to the goldsmiths, I want you to make all these gold discs and make sure that you stamp my face on so everybody knows whose empire this is, in case there's any dispute. So this, the goldsmiths would provide money to the king, he give that to the soldiers. Now everybody wants those discs because it's important for taxes. The king says, okay, the rule says you have to give me so and so many discs in the occupied lands, and everybody wants to help feed these armies. This is essential to maintaining the armies. So, now you can have standardized trade and travel. This is how the empires were forged. And the next step, I'm zap zapping quite fast into uh, known history here, 1694, very important date in the development of plutocracy, because this is the first successful central bank. There was one before that that wasn't very successful, this one was, and this was because, this is basically thought up by the bankers. The king was having trouble collect, collecting new loans from the nobles, the rich people. He had been a bit slack on repaying them. So they're thinking, well, maybe we don't want to lend to the king because we might need it back. But the, the bankers came up with a brilliant suggestion, a brilliant from their point of view, um, the legalization of the fractional reserve. Now, I should explain what the fractional reserve is. The goldsmiths would take your gold and give you a little piece of paper and say, that this was, could be exchanged for the gold. So they are issuing, this is the, the origins of paper money in Europe, and the fractional reserve came about because they figured out that they could issue this paper, and then it would work like gold in the marketplace. Somebody would not actually come and cash the gold all the time, they would just carry the paper around because it was easier. Then they thought, okay, so what about if we made some more paper without having any gold? That could be good, because they can lend this out, and the interest is legal at this stage. So this is what a lot of bankers did. I mean, it's basically fraud, 
If you said this paper is as good as gold and you can swap it anytime you like, well, if you're issuing more paper than you've got gold, you can get into trouble like that. But these guys said, okay, King, how about uh, we'll make a thing called the Bank of England. It's a private company. It'll have shares and so on. And it will have a monopoly over issuing of money in England. So that only our bits of paper will be special. And you will say that they are acceptable as taxes. That's key because then everybody wants them. And even the people who don't pay taxes, they know that a lot of people need them. So it's like, okay, I'll take this. So that's what the bankers did. What did they get out of it? Well, they did put in some gold. There was supposed to be a limit on the amount of paper that they could make. Maybe 10 times the amount of gold that they had. That was, that's the fraction. And they kept a proportion of it in reserve. But they can basically create as much money as they like. And then they say, okay, to the king, what do you get out of it? Well, anytime you need money, come to us. We'll lend it to you at 8%, I think it was. So this is the origin of the national debt. The national debt is not owned for, owed from one country to the next. It's owed by the rulers to the guys who are running the central bank. So this was never actually paid back. It's still not paid back. And then the bankers thought, okay, we came up with that scheme and, and he okayed it. I mean, you know, he's the king. You can't argue with the king. He says, hey, you're the bankers. I'm tired of you. I'm going to repossess you. And okay, we'll cut your heads off as well. He's the king. He's got the army on his side. How do you, how do you go against that? But there's some kind of contradiction here because they are providing him with money. So shouldn't they be actually setting the terms? Well, that's what they thought. How come he gets to order us around because we're the guys with the money? This, this should work another way. And they, they managed to figure out how to do it because they organized internationally. Inside of one country that you can't argue with the king. What is the king afraid of? He's afraid of guys coming with and rolling him over because they've got more guns than him. So there, this is the most important step that was, okay, hundreds of years ago, but it has great implications today because the king was really at some point no longer in charge. They were in charge because of their international organization. So how did that actually work? Well, it's been called the Rothschild formula because there was a banker in the 18th century, Maya Amschel Rothschild, he was uh, quite wealthy, and he had five sons. He said, okay, you go to England, you to France, you to Italy, you to Austria. You can stay here. When I'm gone, you can run it in, in Germany. And there was five bankers in this family, and they, each one of them became very wealthy. The Bank of England central bank franchise model became standard throughout Europe. And that puts us in a situation where, okay, the, the, na the nations are busy fighting each other. And how do they fight each other with money? They, they borrow armies, they borrow it, maybe from somebody in the country, but also from foreign, foreign bankers. So there's basically one group of bankers who control who gets to borrow money from them and who doesn't. So they're, of course, closely connected to the arms dealers. You don't actually fight a war with money, but uh, they manage that, but there's one group and they said, okay, if you want to borrow money from me, of course, you're going to have to sign about when you're going to pay it back. Uh, but you're also going to have to agree that if you actually defeat this, this king that you're fighting, you're going to make sure that those loans get paid back as well. Because I don't want to, I'm going to lose out otherwise. I'm not going to fund you so that you can beat him if I don't get paid back. So whoever actually won these wars, because of this condition, well, the bankers got to, I mean, it, it happens nowadays that there's wars going on. Bankers can lend to both sides. They say, okay, I think, I think uh, he's, this guy's getting a bit weak. Maybe we better make him uh, lend him some more money. So how does this divide and conquer system actually break down? If one king got to rule the whole show, if he maybe was in charge of Europe, then he'd say, hey, why do I need these bankers anyway? Forget those treaties. But... This is a bit of a dangerous prospect for the bankers. So does that give you another perspective on why they were always fighting these wars and nobody was actually completely winning? Well, I never heard anything about this when I was studying history and wars. They all talk about Protestants against the Catholics or these other differences. And yeah, maybe that was important. But what was also important that somebody was, was making money from all these wars. 
You know, nothing puts people into debt the way that war puts you into debt. Not only that you have to buy new weapons and so on, but people were doing things like knocking down castles and blowing up bridges. And yeah, that's a good way to make somebody poor, to make them need to borrow money. So they worked out, okay, they are getting extremely rich from this process of uh, basically helping themselves to what, what the national treasury, because it's all legal. You know, the king agrees that he's going to pay 8% on this money that he borrowed. So in the 19th century, they have lots of money, and yeah, they probably had wild parties and built themselves big estates, but there's a limit, and they know that this money is some kind of a fiction, because they are in charge of it, and they, they can just make this paper out of nothing. So what do they want? They're looking for power. How do they get power? Well, they already have quite a good influence over the national governments. So they're in a good position to say, okay, well, these corporations, you know, they had corporations, but they were originally very few in number. They were marginal, and you needed to maybe get a law passed to even, even start one up. Ah, that's a bit of a hassle. So the, what we see in the 19th century is that corporations become more and more dominant, and the legal systems are getting changed so that uh, it gets easier and easier to create these corporations. And originally, you maybe start a corporation that does one thing, it builds a railway or a canal or something, and then after 10 years, 20 years, it's done, it's finished, it's dissolved. And there's strict limitations on what they can do. Well, this goes to the wall in the 19th century, especially in the US. You have this uh, lovely Bill of Rights about the, the, what the person has uh, legally empowered to do. And those same, because you get this idea that, oh, okay, well, a corporation is legally should be a person. And the corporations say, okay, I've got a right to privacy. I've got a right to all these things that people used to have rights to. So they build up a large infrastructure that, I mean, we, for, we, we just think this is the way that life is. But it was, a, it was an innovation at the time that there's large top-down hierarchies where you have to do what the, what the boss says. And who gets to run these? Well, who gets to own them? Oh, the super rich. That's handy. So now you've got this, you've got the machinery is there for mass production. What do you need? You need a lot of people at the bottom level. People who say, yes, boss, yes, boss, of course. Well, in the land of independent farmers, like the US used to be, people went to the US because they didn't want to take orders. Why would they want to be in corporations? This is where mass compulsion schooling comes in. Now, maybe you think schooling is about helping the poor to become educated and to get free. I don't think so. Actually, it was a project of the rich industrialists. I mean, the first lesson that you learn in school is shut up, I'm the teacher, you got to be here on time, and uh, don't run around and do things you want to do. Do what I say. So economic literacy is a particular unfavorite of mine. You know, literacy is about, okay, you can learn to read books, you can go ahead, find out what you want to find. Economic literacy is completely different. Economic literacy says that uh, you are economically literate if you know that People should be self-interested, and if you're not self-interested, then you're kind of irrational. So it's, it's basically brainwashing you to think in a certain way, that specific way, that means that you do a cost-benefit analysis on everything. Now, that sounds, again, like common sense in a certain perspective, but if there's a group of people who have an unlimited amount of money because they control the money system, they're in a good position to manipulate the cost-benefit analysis. Here's a, another angle on economics that uh, if you learned economics, maybe you thought, okay, if you want to borrow money as an individual, then you get some money from the banks, do some business, pay it back with interest, because of course banks need interest, huh? they've got to make a profit. So that is the micro level. I'm encouraging you to look at it on the macro level. We humanity borrow money from banks, certain amount, we have to give it back with interest. Where does the interest come from? We are not allowed to make our own money. You know, there's all these laws about forgery and so on. And, oh, well, then I guess it's got to come from the banks, hasn't it? So we, we get it from the banks next year if they're feeling, if they're feeling like they're, they're kind to us. Thanks, boss. So basically, you're getting more and more in debt. The economics, the microeconomics says, if you're a good businessman, you can make some profit. Okay, great. I don't care who's good at business and who's not. It's not possible for everybody to pay back those loans to the bank. And the bank can control this. They have a little dial called the interest rate. And if they in increase the interest rate, if they don't give new loans, more and more people will go under. So it's a divide and conquer mechanism against the people. 
Now, I'm claiming that this is tribute. This is the equivalent of in the, in the Viking days, the Vikings would come to your village and say, I want some gold, otherwise we're going to come back and we'll destroy your village. They, that was quite effective at getting gold. But it was also effective at annoying people. <laughs> they, they didn't like it. Well, this is what we have now in the money system. But if you're economically literate, you know that that's, that's the way that it's supposed to be. Because you've been trained to see it from a certain perspective. And okay, people are getting in more and more debt. What is this money system that has got people's loyalty? Originally, it was a personal gift from you to somebody else, a token of how much you appreciated them. And that became standardized in these larger groups. Then we have the metal discs. That was very large range. Then, okay, we gave up a bit about the metal. It becomes fiat money, paper money. This is becoming very, very anonymous. You know, if, you, if you run the show, you can say, okay, let's create another 700 billion bailout dollars, whatever, on the computer. Who knows? Um, and then you get onto financial vehicles, uh, derivatives, or credit de default swaps, all kind of funky stuff like that. And there's a lot of war going on about that because the guys who run the show are saying, no, this is absolutely has to be the case. There's other people saying, look, we haven't got a house. We didn't do anything wrong. It's like, well, this is the system. And the, the, the assumption is always that it cannot be changed. Globalization is another case in point. It's presented like, well, this is kind of the way that the world is. That this, has to be, this has to be. And all these kind of boring... Uh, you're not told much about... Well, I was not told much about this in school. These international bodies, they're supranational, really. I mean, who runs the IMF? Who is running the WTO? I don't know these things. Maybe I'm just terribly underinformed. But you don't hear about this very much. But this allows national governments to say, okay, well, I, we have to keep these kind of terms of, we have signed up to this. I would love to, to do these things that the people want, but there's a higher authority that is in no way democratically represented. And the logic is basically the same, that, okay, it's, it, we have to run things by the market. And who actually set up the market? Oh, the money masters, who are they? Oh, I don't know, they didn't, uh, I didn't learn about them on the television. Why not? Because, oh, they're the rich, they, they, they own the television. So that is you, for, for most people, <laughs> you're getting fed by these corporations, they're giving you orders, they're giving you money, and you're working for them. And then there's the uh, enforcers. What was the last time that European armies were used to fight other European armies? It was not that recently. We've seen things like the whole uh, pepper spray incident, and they're basically there to keep you under control. And, of course, they are controlled by the politicians. Now, that is the limit of the picture as it's presented uh, on the corporate media. In fact, of course, the politicians are highly responsive to the uh, donations or the lobbying or whatever you call it. But the, the corporations also, we've seen it. Huge corporations like General Motors are going out of business because they don't get some money. Somebody else, AIG, whatever, they're getting all sorts of money. Who makes those decisions? Isn't that important? Well, human beings are making those decisions. They don't perhaps advertise the fact, they'd like you to think, well, that's the economic fact of life, but suggest, I didn't think it is. So I, I hope that you have clear that uh, it, it's a means of extracting tribute, basically. I didn't talk about whether it's a safe store of value, but if they double the money supply, your $1,000 in the bank, that's still worth $1,000, but if all the prices have doubled, <laughs> half your savings have gone. Who got that? Oh, well, who got the extra money that they made? Oh, well, maybe they didn't ask you about that. Uh, so it's a measure of how close you are to where the free money appears out of nowhere that they don't like to talk about. Certainly it's intimately connected to the, I mean, the, the euro. Who created the euro? That was a project of the Bilderberg Group. So if you don't know who the Bilderberg Group are, you might want to Google on it because the euro is kind of important. But yeah, strange that we didn't hear much about it. My claim is this, that as people discover that the money system is actually not a fact of life, that it was thought up, that it has, okay, for a long time it's been running, but it serves the interests of a very few people. Most people are increasingly getting uh, stolen, getting robbed by the system, that we have the ability to make up a new system. And that's, that's what I've been doing for the last few years. What would I recommend that you do? Um, don't fight these guys. I mean, that, that's what they do. Just walk away from them as best that you can. Work out how to survive without using money. And there are people who do that, even in Germany. Uh, I mean, where I live in Bangladesh, three quarters of people feed themselves from their own, their own labor. 
it does become quite, yeah, quite easily to imagine that, that, okay, the money system collapses, whatever, the, the rice is still growing in the fields. Um, you will not get a lot of warning from the collapse of the money system. Um, and uh, I'm going to have a workshop, uh, BO4, that's just around the corner. Um, and if there's any, qu any time, I would welcome your questions. Thank you. I think we do have time for a short question. So please raise your hand if you have one. Right here in the front row. I'll get the mic to you. Just a quick question. Uh, what's the percentage of hunger in uh, Bangladesh, and what's the percentage of hunger in Germany? Uh, that's, that's a complicated one. Uh, I would say physical hunger, there are more hungry people in Bangladesh. Spiritual, intellectual, every other kind of hunger, there are a lot of people who are not happy here. Uh, on that note, thank you every, uh, everybody for attending. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, workshop in about half an hour, so if you're interested, join it. Thank you very much again.